Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Eunice. So great to see you all. It's weird seeing you all on a Saturday. Um, good morning to everyone online as well. Today is day two of our Labor Day conference. Uh, and so we're going to get started this morning uh, with some worship. So um, let me pray for us really quick and we will get started. Father God, we just thank you so much. Uh, for this morning, um, for your mercies that are new every morning. Lord Jesus, we um, are here to worship you. We're here to meet you. Um, Lord, we pray that your presence fills this room. Uh, Lord, that your Holy Spirit fills us, God, as we worship. Um, we commit this time into your hands. Uh, we praise you. We thank you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. is my desire. This is my desire to
Father God, we turn our eyes to you this morning. Lord Jesus, fix our eyes on you on the cross. Lord, we thank you for your love and for your grace, Lord, that allows us to be here. God, everything we do, all the thing, all the words we just sang, Lord, um, how we live our lives, God, let it all be for you. Lord Jesus, we praise your name. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. You may all be seated. We'll give the following time to Pastor Ernie. Yes? Yes? Okay. Well, thank you. Ooh. Thank you very much for allowing me to come again and to be part of Labor Day Conference 2023. And uh, I hope you have a Bible with you. If you do, I'm going to be reading from the book of Joel. And I'm hoping that this morning we can do more than just learn the story of Joel. Uh, Old Testament, minor prophet, Maybe some of the cleanest pages of your Bible are right there in that minor prophet section of the Old Testament. But they're not called minor prophets because what they say is minor or not as important as the major prophets. I'd go as far as to say they're not minor prophets because they're not as important as what we read in the Gospels and in the book of Acts and the epistles. All the Bible is the word of God. All of it is inspired by God. And all of it, Paul writes to Timothy, is profitable. Profitable for instruction, for reproof, for correction. And the reason God speaks to us through his word is so that we might become perfect, mature, grown up, raised up, built up, men and women, young people of God. And so part of that whole scenario is the book of Joel. And Joel tells your story and mine and I guess we could say everybody's story is told and found in the book of Joel. Uh, and you might find you in theirs too someplace. I'm sure you will. It's from the beginning of our lives until the very end of our lives by the grace of God. And it talks to us about rising up and building. Now, when that theme was presented to me for this conference, uh, I thought, uh, of course, because of the two aspects, rise up, number one, and build the number two. And sometimes the rising up part is harder than the building part. Uh, now, we need to rise up before we can build. You can't really build from your bed or from your laziness or from slothfulness. We've got to be roused in our spirits. We've got to rise up in ourselves and in our spirit 
And we've got to be in the place where we can, having been raised up, can then contribute to the building up of the kingdom of God in what God wants to accomplish in the earth. You know, God wants to do great things in 2023. I don't know if you believe that. I hope you do. I hope it's not all in the past. That God worked mightily back in those days when this was going on and they had that revival. And God wants to do it again. God wants this generation, you and I, who are part of this generation, to rise up and be part of what God wants to do in the earth today. And where sin abounds, the Apostle Paul said, grace doth much more abound. God has grace or help for us. If you think the world is bleak and sinful and dark and wicked and, the, and on and on, and it is, and it might be going from worse to worse and things, uh, deceivers go from deceiving to being deceived and greater deceptions, and it just all unravels. But at the very same time as that's going on, the dichotomy in the Word of God is that God is building a church, and He's building a church with those who are rising up and building for the kingdom of God. And so when you get to the story of Joel, and, and if you have it opened up, uh, I'm going to read from the first verse, first chapter. I, I won't read every verse throughout the whole uh, several chapters in Joel, but we'll read a lot of them. And so the Lord, the word of the Lord comes to Joel and uh, says this. Hear this, Joel. You elders, listen, all who live in the land. Has anything like this ever happened in your days? Now, he's going to say stuff to them that they were experiencing. They were literally, really experiencing. I've never experienced what I'm going to read to you about. Maybe none of us have ever experienced it, at least to the degree. Anybody know what locusts are? Do you have locusts out here in California? Some. Okay, get rid of them if you see them. Don't, they're no good. Locusts, and uh, I, I, I didn't know what they were either. I asked my wife, I said, do we have locusts in New York? She said, I don't know. And then she said to me a few minutes later, she said, cicadas are locusts. You know what a cicada is? You got them out here? It's kind of like a locust. There are different species and different types of locusts, but they're, they're not good. They're not good. Now, if you see one or two, don't worry. Don't worry. Don't call the police. Don't dial 911. It's okay. Uh, just step on it. Uh, it uh, make believe I didn't say that. But do what you got to do to get rid of whatever that locust may be. But locusts don't come in one or twos. That's the problem with locusts. They come in swarms, in bunches, and uh, like bananas, only more. And they, they're more and more locusts. And they, they've been known to be so thick, the locusts, that in the middle of the daytime, they can actually obliterate the light of the sun. And you can look up and you can see just dark. It's really just seeing locusts because they're, they're, they're swarming. And when they swarm over a land, over an area of growth, they can go through the Napa Valley. Anybody know where the Napa Valley is? You've been there? You've seen the grapes growing? Uh, they can go through that Napa Valley if the swarm of locusts would come. And in a matter of a couple days, there'd be nothing green left at all in the Napa Valley. They, they literally just eat away at every living thing, every green thing, everything with life in it. They'll bring it down to the dirt. That, that's what locusts do. They're very destructive. They're very insidious, and they don't come in ones or twos. And so Joel is about to hear from the Lord, and the Lord says, Okay, Joel, you've never seen anything like this in your days or in the days of your forefathers. You're going to be telling this to your children, and your children will tell it to their children, and their children to their children, and we could keep on going forever. But you'll be talking about this, what's been going on and what is going on in the land. You'll be talking about this from generation to generation. I mean, you'll tell your grandkids, you haven't seen anything like it. I was there when it happened. It was amazing. And you'll tell the story. And it'll go on and on. What the locust swarm has left. The great locusts have eaten. There's different kinds of locusts, all the same stuff. And what the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten. And what the young locusts have left, other locusts have eaten. Now, I don't know, I don't know if uh, we have any pictures of locusts or what they can do, but maybe if you just look for a moment 
that's not a locust. <laughs> that's me. I'm safe. You don't have to worry about a thing. But oh, oh, they're uh, superimposed on the locusts. Is, don't worry. Get rid of me in there. And can you see the before and the after? Maybe you saw it. Maybe it was too quick for you to see it, to notice. But you have before locusts, which was green and nice, and then post, oh, there, uh, uh, getting out of there. Uh, there's the difference. Locusts ravage a land. But, you know, there are spiritual locusts. Now, these aren't spiritual locusts, and I'm not one either. But there are, well, the Apostle Paul would say, we're fighting not against locusts, not flesh and blood, not insects, but we're fighting against powers of darkness that are as destructive, insidious as locusts. And they come over a life or a nation or a family or an individual they swarm, and before they're done, and it doesn't take them long, they can take a person and devastate that person and cause them to be from life to death spiritually. They can mess you up, is what I'm trying to say. If you allow the locusts, if there's this infestation in a life, and you can, again, I'm not going to go through every time I say this. It could be a life, a family, a city, a nation, a people, a universe. But the locusts don't just operate on mega levels, nor do they just operate on you. They start with you, and they seek to, brother, you read it last night, or we read it from the book of Matthew. The enemy has come to steal and to kill and to destroy. Now, I, I wish I could indelibly imprint that in some of our minds, maybe all of our minds. The enemy is out to destroy you, as beautiful as you are, as full of life as you are. I've lived long enough, and some of you have also lived long enough to see people who have been filled with life and growth and vegetation, and it's all going well. And then the locusts come. And there's nothing in them that repels the locusts. In Isaiah 59, the Lord says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord raises a standard against it. But there are some people that don't put up a fight. They don't fight back. They don't repel. They don't take the armor of God. They just are prey to the enemy that comes in, rolls into their minds, into their hearts, into their lives, into their bodies seeking to kill and to destroy. And Jesus, all the while in John 10, 10, says, I've come to give you life. I've come to give you life, and I want to give you life more abundantly. So take heed to yourselves. And sometimes we need to maybe be brought up to the fact that even you and me, when we were born, when we were first born and started to grow up, the Bible says we were dead in our trespasses and in our sins. See, right from the beginning of our lives, without you doing a thing, the locusts have gotten a hold of you. You were conceived or born not out of uh, a legitimate relationship, but by birth we are sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. Your parents may have been Christians, godly men and women, but that doesn't make you a godly man or woman. We were born spiritually dead in our trespass and in our sin. And it would be the job of the locust to keep us there. And growing up, it would be the job of the locust if there's ever life that begins to form and grow in us. And I'm not talking about biological life. I'm talking about spiritual life. The enemy turns to attack on that life and to destroy. And we kind of figure, well, we grew up in the church. We grew up in Christianity. We grew up, and some of us did, and some of us didn't. But we figure, well, we're kind of like just on the fast track to heaven. There is no fast track to heaven. There's a fast track to hell left undone. That's where we're all heading. But Jesus Christ has interrupted that path, and he wants to bring into our hearts, our souls, life. 
He wants us to rise up and he wants us to build our lives on the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. So at the beginning of our experiences, every one of us, by fact that we're human beings, we've had this problem with locusts. That's described here in the nation of Israel, described very candidly. And then the Lord goes after them and he says, wake up, you drunkards. Weep, wail, all you drinkers of wine. Well, because of the new wine, for it has been snatched from your lips. A nation has invaded my land, powerful and without number. It has the teeth of a lion, fangs of a lioness, and goes on and on. I'm not going to read the on and on. But he's talking about another nation that would come and take over Judah and Jerusalem and conquer them. Like locusts, they would just swarm over them. Why? Why was it that God's people were vulnerable? Weren't they God's people? He called them the apple of his eye. He called them his own children. And now all of a sudden they're in a situation, in a condition. Now, now they're being swept over by locusts. Well, not locusts, by Babylonians, by Assyrians, by attackers. And like fangs, well, lions with fangs and not, not sparing at all the people of God. But why? How did it happen? And you read through the story of Joel and you find it was because they had opened the door to sin. It was mentioned already uh, last night in the meeting. We open the door and the enemy s sneaks in a little bit. And the enemy rears his ugly head a little bit. And we begin to play around with this idea or that philosophy or, or that thought. And we can handle it because we go to church on Sunday. So it's really, we could almost sin with impunity. But we can't. And we allow the enemy to come in. And the Israelites and people of Judah, Samaria, and Jerusalem, they, they opened the door for idolatry. They prostituted themselves. They became inebriated with the things of this life. You read of it all through the Bible, but especially in Revelation, you get to that 17th, 18th chapter where he talks, as the Lord talks to John in the Revelation, about the spirit of Babylon. That spirit that works in the children of disobedience. And how all the nations of the world drink the wine of the wrath, of the fornication of that system of Babylon. It's not just a system, a city set somewhere. It's not geographical. It's not the, these nations or these peoples. But it's a whole spirit that pervades. Even in California, you have a spirit of Babylon. We have it back in New York, too no matter where we're from. It's something that works throughout, well, all the nations of the world. And they drink of that. And they, they drink of the mammon of unrighteousness, the things of this world. And Israel began to do that. Oh, we can, we can have our gods, Yahweh, Jehovah, God, praise God, hallelujah. But then the rest of the week, they go to an Asherah pole. They go to an altar of Baal. And little by little by little, Yahweh, Jehovah God, was worked out of their lives, out of their system, out of their culture. There were vestiges, but just vestiges of the, the flavor and the tenor of God's word among them. You know, that happens and maybe has been happening in our society. I, I'm older than most of you that are here. And I can remember, I can remember back in the years that, uh, well, when in God we trust wasn't just uh, on the money and wasn't just stamped as a motto, but we really did have a trust in God as a nation. As the United States of America, there was a basis of Judeo-Christian ethics where God was respected, the house of God, the people of God were respected, the principles of the word of God were respected. I don't know what it's like in California, but it's not that way in New York. Now the people of God aren't very well respected. They're disdained, they're mocked, they're ridiculed, they're laughed at because of their puerile ideas stuck back in the dark ages. They haven't become current at all. And we've been as a people of God, as a church of Jesus Christ, marginalized. And the things of this world and the systems and the spirit of Babylon has taken over and the nations of the world have been drinking 
and have gotten, as Joel says, you're drunk. you got to wake up. Not literal why, not that they are inebriated because they drank too much of whatever it was, but the whole spirit of the world has gotten into them, and they have now, they have now apostatized. They have now turned away from the living God. There were churches that the Holy Spirit addressed in the book of Revelation. It happened there too. It's not just Old Testament. It's not just Joel. It's not just 2023. It's all through the Word of God. And there in Revelation, the Lord says, you have a reputation. You have a name there in Sardis. You have a name that you live. But you're not alive anymore. You're dead. And I assess you as a group of people that the locusts have swept over. And you were once alive, but you're not alive anymore. Now you're dead. Now there's nothing left but fumes. And there the Holy Spirit goes after them and enjoins upon them, you've got to rise up again. God, by His grace, wants you to rise up again. He has made it possible for you to rise up again. You don't need to wallow around where you are any longer. But as the people of God, wake up and rise up and begin to build here on earth. Let your kingdom come and let your will be done here on earth even as it's being done in heaven. And so Joel, as he speaks to the Israelites and children of God back in the years that he was alive, I hear his words in this year, in this generation, as if they were as current as the daily news. Because we as God's people, and we have always as God's people, been under attack. If you read in Revelation chapter 12, at the end of the chapter there, we read a story in Revelation 12 as how Satan was booted out of heaven. You remember that story? I saw seven, Satan fall from heaven as lightning. And unfortunately, when he was booted out, you know where he landed? He landed in California. Well, he landed on planet Earth. And... Uh, and he's been around. But it says there in Revelation 12, he also knows that he's doomed. He also knows that he's defeated. He also knows that the kingdom of God is victorious. And he knows that the church of Jesus Christ, the gates of hell can't prevail against it. If they would only rise up and build. There's an available source and power that is found in Jesus Christ and in the kingdom of God that they can be overcomers even in the days that they live when it's dark. I know where you, you live, another church in Revelation. I know where you dwell. You live right where Satan's seat is. But I have a few names in that city that have not defiled themselves. They walk with me in white. They're worthy. They're my people. They rise up. And they build. And so we all have started out. And I hope I'm not talking to anybody here. I hope you don't look at your life and say, the thing is ravaged. It's devastated. I am so eaten out. Uh, I don't, don't mean you ate out yesterday. I mean your interior is so gone spiritually. I'm dead. My mind is like a sieve. It's an open door for the devil to roam around and do whatever he's got to do. My body, it's the same thing. I do what I got to do with my body and whatever I want to do with it. I, I hope nobody's like that here. Maybe, though, we're not like we just read, but maybe we're just a little bit like that. You know, we sometimes, as God's people, I, I believe, and I found it in my own heart, my own life, we think we're more than we are. We think we're okay, but maybe we're not. We think we can handle the little locusts, the great locusts, because as long as the young ones aren't around and as long as the small ones don't get them. We think we're, we're okay. Don't worry about me. I, I've had people tell me that. I can think of a man right now who I love dearly and grew up playing ball together with him and from one of our churches back home in New York. And, and he used to everything, sing in the choir and had a gospel group that they sang together with and a good guy, nice guy. I still love the guy. But about 40 years ago now, he hit a cold spot. That's the way he put it to me. I hit a cold spot in my life. That was 40 years ago. He's still in the cold spot. I worry about him. I'm concerned with him. 
Maybe you've hit a cold spot in your life. Maybe you're here at LDC in 2023, and you're glad even to be here. It's nice to be here, get to see old friends, get to meet new people. It's okay to be here. I can handle two days of this. But maybe you look in your heart and your life and say, but it's not, I've left my first love. I, it used to be red hot prior for Jesus. I used to be all gung-ho about rising up and building. And now, I mean, I'm here for the weekend and I'm ready to rise up and build. But come Monday afternoon, I'll go back to sleep and let everybody else rise up and build because I'm nowhere to be found. Maybe that's where we are. No, not ravaged and completely eaten out by the locusts, but maybe, maybe our hearts have grown a little bit cold. There was a man in the Bible named Isaiah. You know his story. I mean his personal story, not just the things that he wrote and the prophecies that he spoke, but his personal story was, I, I was a prophet. I was a prophet that spoke the word of the Lord. So God would speak to me, and I would go to the nation of Israel, and I would say, thus saith the Lord. And I wasn't making it up. I mean, thus saith the Lord. And the Lord told me what to say, and I said it. But then in Isaiah chapter 6, you remember the story. Isaiah said, the year King Uzziah died, I, I had a vision. I saw the Lord. I mean, I saw the Lord like I had never seen the Lord before. I thought I knew all about him. I thought I knew his ways. I had communion with him and fellowship with him, and he told me what to say, and I would say what he told me to say. And I was doing pretty well there. I was rolling better than most of the people around me in the community. But, boy, that year that the king died, whew, that was a year for me. Let me tell you, I saw, I actually saw the Lord. I mean, I saw the throne of God, and I saw the glory of God. I had never seen such a thing in all my life, but my eyes were opened. I saw the Lord high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. And then he said, Isaiah said, and for the first time in my life, I didn't only see him, but I saw me. For the first time in my life, me, the prophet, the mouthpiece and spokesperson for God, you know, the good kid on the block. And I got a sight of the Lord. I got a sight of myself. And when I saw myself, I, the only thing I could say is, it says in the, in the English Bible, woe is me. The literal translation there in the Hebrew is, I'm ruined. I am absolutely ruined. I mean, I, I am so messed up and mixed up, I don't know, up from down. I am totally ruined because I have now seen what God is how pure he is, how righteous he is, how holy he is. And when I saw him, you know, I thought I had a white shirt on until I saw really what white was. And I saw that my shirt was kind of like dull gray. I wasn't as pure and clean as I thought I was. I had stains and spots on my shirt. I never recognized it. I'm ruined. And then he said these words, Isaiah, the prophet, the man who spoke God's word. He said, these are his words in Isaiah 6. You can read them. He said, I am, woe is me, I am undone. I am, a, see, there they are again. You remember what they look like. I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. Isaiah. You're a man of unclean. No, no, Isaiah, you got the wrong guy, not you. You're the guy that goes to church and sings, Hallelujah, and praise the Lord, and I love Jesus, I love. You're that guy. You're not the guy. Of unclean. No, wait, wait, Isaiah said, no. The, the way that I talk when I'm not listening to God and when I'm out of the fellowship with God's people, the things that come out of my mouth, not necessarily the four-letter words, but just the slander and the gossip and all the rotten stuff that I talk Oh, man, I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and the guys all around me aren't much of a help. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips because now I've finally seen the Lord. Have you ever had a time in your life when you really came face to face and encounter with God? And if you did, how did you do? I mean, how did you come out of it? Did you say, oh, Lord, me and you, we're kind of like on the same level? We're not. 
Because when our eyes are open, then we really could see ourselves. But, but I, I grew up in the church. Yeah, okay, that's, that's good. That's one for you. But has your heart ever been changed? Take my heart, O oh God. Make it more like you. Take my heart, cleanse me from every sin. Take my mind, Lord. I know it's not just it's every now and again, but Lord, the thoughts and the meditations of my heart. Oh, Lord, may they be acceptable in thy sight. You remember King David? When he was just a young man, he too knew the Lord. Sat on the mountaintops or the hills when he watched the sheep and he, he writes, the heavens declare the glory of God. He talks about being in the presence of God. He sings about it often uh, from his vantage point as he writes the Psalms and, and how, uh, how those who ascend to the hill of the Lord are those with clean hands and a pure heart, haven't lifted up their soul to vanity or sworn deceitfully. They ascend to the hill of the Lord. But then David found that he was no match. I mean, that King David, with all his experiences and all his upbringing and all that he had in his, in his background and in his, in his uh, resume, no, no good. And here he was there alone. And you know the story in 1 Samuel 12. He's standing there and looking out over the, the land, the vast land all around him when the men are off to war and he sees, he sees Bathsheba. And then he wants her. He sleeps with her. He has a child with her. Then he has Uriah, her husband, killed. King David. The enemy has come to steal and to kill. But it can never happen to King David. I mean, I'm the guy, you know, with the harp and singing on the mountain. Yeah, I'm that guy. It's, that can't happen to me. You want to know your heart's deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. You and I, and I'm not trying to impugn anything on anybody, but I want to tell you, your heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. We desperately need a Savior. We desperately need to repent. We desperately need to have a new heart put into us and an old heart taken out of us. And we desperately need the renewing of our mind being transformed. We desperately need to rise up and to let Christ build his kingdom in us. And so David, after he recognized his sin, thoroughly repented, Psalm 51, Psalm 32, or two Psalms that speak his repentance. When I was in sin, I felt lousy. I felt like the locust had gotten me. I felt terrible. My tongue claved to the roof of my mouth. I I was parched. I, I just felt out of sorts. I felt miserable. I felt guilty. I felt, I felt wrecked by sin. Have mercy upon me, O oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. David rose up again. And God began to restore and to build in David again. And then David not only could build up inwardly himself, but he was able then to build up among and with the people of God, a city of God. That's what God can do. That's his plan for our lives. So you go on in the story here. It, it says, oh, let me jump down to the 12th verse, the end part of the 12th verse. Joel says, surely the joy of mankind is withered away. I think that's an apt description of our society. The joy of mankind is withered away. I'm not talking about happiness that lasts for an evening or an hour or two or three, but that deep-seated joy. I don't think there are a whole lot of people that know what that is. I don't think the people that are outside of the family and the kingdom of God really have a deep-seated joy. If you want joy, real joy, wonderful joy, the songwriter says, let Jesus come into your heart. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And I think we live in a society where the joy of mankind has withered away. 
and they try to find happiness. They try to find joy. They look for it at the bottom of a the bottom of a bottle, at the end of a needle, a relationship, maybe enough money. Maybe if I got more money, a bigger paycheck, a, a better place, a bigger house, somewhere or other. There's got to be joy out there, someplace to satisfy what I'm trying to satisfy, and I'm not finding it. And I've got, I've got the six, eight, whatever figure salary. I've got my own office now, and I, I've, got, I've got everything that life could have to offer me, but I, I still haven't really found what I'm looking for on the inside. Before your time, there was a, a guy that sang for the, I think it was the Rolling Stones, a guy named Mick Jagger. Anybody remember Mick Jagger? I saw an interview with him. I think he's still alive. He looks like he's been dead for a long time. <laughs> If you, if you look at a picture of him, but I think he's still alive. But uh, I saw an interview with him. This is years ago already. He, he made famous a song. I think it's called, I may, I may have the title wrong, but it's something like, Ain't Got No Satisfaction. I mean, that's not poor. That's, he's an Englishman, but that's poor English. But Ain't Got No Satisfaction. And he sings the song, and he made it famous, and he and his group made it famous. And they were interviewing him. And they ask him something about that song. You ain't got no satisfaction. Have you found satisfaction yet? His answer was, I still ain't got no satisfaction. How pathetic that is. You and I who know where joy is, who know where it lies, and we found it so, and there's a well that springs up within us, a well of joy. And here's a man that had everything that life had to offer, excepting a relationship with Jesus Christ. And you talk about the locusts eating away. The poor guy, I, I knew a man that knew Mick Jagger personally and was on planes and flew to England with him and did stuff with him together on those planes before he got saved. And he tells me of how empty and dissatisfied every single one of them are. The locusts, the joy of mankind is withered away. I'm glad the story doesn't end there because Joel says to the people of God, why don't you put on some sackcloth, verse 13. Priests, you should start mourning and wail you who minister before this altar, come spend the night in sackcloth. You who minister before God for the grain offering, the drink offering, and are withheld from the house of your God. Dedicate a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Summon the elders and all who live in the land uh, to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord for help. Alas for that day, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like the destruction from the Almighty. Has not the food been cut off before our, our very eyes? Joy and gladness is cut off from the house of our God. The seeds are shriveled beneath the clods. The storehouses are in ruins. The granaries have been broken down. For the grain has dried up. How the cattle mourn or moan. The herds mill about because they have no pasture. And on and on. He writes about, again, the condition, the situation, uh, the devastation, the dearth. And he calls upon the people to repent. You know what the word repent means? Give me a, a two-word synonym, anybody. I know you don't like to talk out loud. Oh, good, thank you. You see, you, you did talk out loud. Turn around. Turn around. Joel stands up or is called upon by God to stand up in front of the people of God and say, hey, if anybody's sick and tired of the way you're living, if anybody's sick and tired of your life, if anybody's sick and tired of being, being ravaged by locusts, if anybody wants a change, cry out to God. Call upon Him for mercy. Rise up. Don't sit there like a bump on a log. Shake yourselves. Be moved and roused as a people of God. 
and stop being lazy and just in the in the mold and just go through the motions and and go through it again next week and then go through but rise up and shake off the the cobwebs and cry out to God and repent that's a wonderful word to turn around i've heard people describe it as you uh, know God will go in this way, and now we want to do a 360. No, you don't want to do a 360. Because if you do a 360, you keep going the same direction you were going before you started your 360. You want to do a 180. You want to turn around and go the other direction. That's what Joel, or God, is calling upon his people who are not growing anymore who are settled down and are being messed over, God calls upon his people to do a 180. Now, that requires something. That's that easy. You've got to break the mold. But I'm so comfortable in what I'm doing. I'm, I'm comfortable. I have to change my lifestyle. Yes, that's absolutely right. You'll have to change your lifestyle. No, you may not be able to go and hang around with the same. No, you might have to change that too. Things you loved before are going to have to disappear, and things you're going to find that are new loves are going to come into your life. You're going to have to repent, put on sackcloth, grovel around in the dust. That's how they showed their repentance in Joel's day. And he calls upon the priests and the people of God in the community, all of them, to rise up and to repent of their wickedness, of their waywardness. In chapter 2, and I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but he sounds again the alarm that the locusts are coming, the nations are coming to attack, and you're not going to be left here any longer. But in the 12th verse of that chapter, he says, Even now, even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your hearts, with fasting, with mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and have pity and leave behind a blessing. Oh, he, he will. Oh, that, that's the God that you and I have. That's the God that is not standing there. Well, your picture of God with a club ready to beat the daylights out of you because of how bad you have been in all that you have done, and you don't deserve anything except, so let me just step on you, and let me just get rid of you and annihilate you because you're not my people anymore, and I don't love you anymore. It's just the opposite. God stands there with open arms and says, I love you with an everlasting love. I love you, and I'm merciful and gracious and full of compassion, and if you'll just turn around and come to me, I'm standing here with wide open arms. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And you'll find rest unto your souls. Like the prodigal son who walked away and was wallowing around in the pig's pen and eating the food that the pigs were eating. And then he came to himself and thought, hey, wait a minute. What am I doing here? What in the world am I doing here, living here? I thought this was the good life. And so I ran away from Father's house, and I got all messed up. And now I feel like the locusts have done a number on me, and they have. But I can go back home to my father, and maybe he'll make me one of his hired servants. I mean, what could I hope for? I could just hope that I could get my foot back in the door. And the story that Jesus tells is that Father is looking yearning, longing for his son, for his daughter to return with open arms. I wish you'd come back today. I wish you would come back right now. If you're needing a change in your heart, if you're needing a change in your life, the merciful God stands before you like Joel stood before the people of God and extends to them his gracious compassion, his love. But he says, I, I don't want you to rend your garments. I don't want you to go through the motions. I don't want you to shed a few tears and say, sorry, I should have done that. I feel bad. I should come. I, I, I want you to really repent from your heart. Rend your hearts, not your garments. I want it to go right down to the bottom of your heart. I want you to thoroughly change and repent and desire forgiveness 
and you'll find then with the Lord mercy, grace, and forgiveness. Again, maybe you've all come this far in the story. I, I hope you have. And maybe I'm not talking to anybody in the story because you've all found the forgiveness, the grace, the mercy, the love. But if there's just one person that hasn't, Going through all that I've gone through is well worth it as far as I'm concerned for that one person. That one prodigal. That one who is dealing with the locusts. That one who needs to come back to father and home. That one that this morning needs to rend your heart and say, God, be merciful to me. He will abundantly pardon. And he will once again restore, build that which the canker worm has eaten away. But the story of Joel doesn't end, nor does it end for you or for me. He goes, he goes on in that second chapter. Surely he has done great things. This is verse 21. Be not afraid, O land. Be glad and rejoice. Surely the Lord has done great things. He sends you abundant showers, verse 23. Both autumn and spring rains as before. The threshing floors will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten, and great locusts, and the young locusts, and the other locusts, and the locust swarm. My great army that I sent among you, you will have plenty to eat until you're full, and you will praise the name of the Lord your God who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be ashamed. Then you will know that I am in Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and that there is none other. Never again will my people be ashamed. So now we've finally caught up to you in real time, I, I hope. Is, is this what I've read? Does that describe you? You got a lot of grain growing and you got a lot of oil and uh, you're enjoying and the blessing of God is rich in your life and you're not living, no, not there anymore. You've come up into higher ground and there you are and it's nice and it's good and it's a blessing and you're thankful for it and you're here this morning and we're singing and rejoicing and, and thanking the Lord for all that he's done for us and, and that's well, that's part of the story. That's part of your story. We started out not so good. God has brought us because of his mercy, his grace, his love, his redemption to a better place in our lives. And we're maybe not yet what we should be, but we're certainly not what we once were. We're in the process now. There's a, there's a building going on. It's the kingdom of God that's being built up in us as individuals, and we are building together and becoming a habitation of God that He wants to indwell by His Spirit. Now, they were working towards that end. We're, again, not quite there, but we're getting there. But then Joel adds this to the end of his, well, the end of the second chapter. And he says in verse 28, and then afterward. And the last 15 minutes of our time we'll probably spend right here. And afterward. Now, what we've read is good enough. Oh, well, maybe it's not. What we read is good, but maybe it's not quite good enough. Because if we're going to build the kingdom of God, if we're not only going to rise up, but if we're going to build, it takes something more than what you and I have to build. The wherewithal, the ability, the strength, the stick to itiveness that's not a word, but I made it up. That, that doesn't come from inside of you. That only comes from God. But how does God get that inside of me? That's where the afterward comes in. To really be what He wants me to be, to build as He wants me to build, to live as He wants me to live, takes more than just, oh, I've been forgiven and my sins have been washed away and I belong to the kingdom of God because of His grace, love, and mercy. That's wonderful. The New Testament would call that the new birth. And except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But when a man is born again, or a woman, when we're born again into the kingdom of God, then we're ready to stand before Him, not in our own righteousness, 
but in an imputed righteousness which is given to us by God through our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we've read so far in Joel's story. But Joel tacks on something else. But afterward, after the repentance, after you're brought back in, after there's joy again restored into your soul, into your heart, and into your life, afterward, I will pour, God is speaking, I will pour out my spirit on all people. And your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and your old men will dream dreams, young men will see visions. Even, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. You return to me, I'll return to you, I'll open up the heavens upon you, and I'll bless you, and then there's coming a time afterward, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon you. Upon not just the men, but the women, my handmaidens. And not just the young men, but the old men, and the old ladies, and the young ladies. There's coming a time that I'm going to just pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Not yet, Joel says, not right now, but afterward. There's coming a time. Now, if you just turn with me in your Bible to the book of Acts, to chapter 2, because these words are, are quoted, the words of Joel's prophecy, are quoted in Acts chapter 2. And here's a time in the history of the church where, if we can just back up a little bit, God had sent his son Jesus into the world. You know the story. You know how Jesus, when he got to be 30 years of age, started his earthly ministry. But you remember he didn't do it all by himself. Do you, you remember? He just didn't. Now, he was Jesus. He was God, the Son of God, God in the flesh. He could have done this all by himself. He didn't really need anybody. He could have risen up and built. But he enlisted the help of others. Do you remember? You've read it before. Name me a couple of those who he enlisted to help him. Peter, James, John, the big three, and a lot of others. He started out just with a dozen others, and one of them went rogue, and then they found another one to take his place, and they wound up with 12 once again. And, and then it went on from 12 to 120, and then 123,000, and then it was just boom, until we get to where we are today. But Jesus started with those disciples. Oh, oh, when he found Peter, Peter, Peter was locust eaten. As a matter of fact, when Jesus went to work with Peter a little while, Peter still wasn't doing quite so well. Do you remember the story? You remember after three years, you'd think after three years something would have gone down, but no, it didn't happen with Peter. Peter was a little slow. He knew who the Lord was. He loved the Lord, but he wasn't quite there yet, and he got to the place where, right, when Jesus was being tried, I, I don't even know who he is. I, him? I don't know him. What did you say his name was? Jesus? Oh, Jesus. Oh, yeah. No, I don't know. Jesus? G whatever you call him. I don't know who that man is. A lady's asking him these questions. A little lady, young woman, damsel. And I, he denied that he ever knew Jesus. I don't know who he is. I never knew, I never knew the man. Peter, you're kind of like, you need some help, Peter. You're not, you're not really a good candidate to be a good Christian. You lie a lot. And you're kind of ashamed of the testimony. Okay, Peter needed help. Was Peter a good man? He was a good man. Did he love the Lord? He loved the Lord. Did he know Jesus was? Yeah, flesh and blood hasn't revealed it to you, but my Father who is in heaven. But Peter needed, if he was going to rise up and build, if he was going to be part of the foundation and part of the building process of the kingdom of God here on earth, Peter was going to need an afterword. He had had an experience, but he needed more than that experience. And so Jesus said, not just to Peter, I just picked on him, but he said to all the disciples, he said, now before you guys go out and build, 
before you go out and try to establish a church and rise up and build a community, before you go out and build the kingdom of God here on earth, even as it's being done in heaven, don't you dare try to do this. I know you can mimic my words. You were there at the Sermon on the Mount, and you can quote what I quoted, and you can say back the words, but you, you don't understand. It takes more than just knowing by rote the Bible or the Scriptures or preach my sermons or know what I've said before. It takes a lot more than that. You need power from on high. You need help if you're going to rise up and build. And Peter, you don't have that power. Nor do you, James, or John, nor do any of you. I want you to go to the city of Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And then, and then, you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so they go to the city of Jerusalem. There are 120 of them in the upper room. The Holy Spirit comes and is poured out upon them. The Bible says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to proclaim the wonderful works of the Lord in the tongues of the people that were all around them. People that didn't know a foreign language learned a foreign language and were able to communicate that foreign language to others that had come from out of the city, out of the country, and joined with them. It was a wonderful manifestation of the power of God to spread the gospel and to rise up and to build the kingdom of God. But none of these disciples or early church had any power until afterward. And they needed to go to the city of Jerusalem until. And then you read, if you got the second chapter of Acts opened up. Uh, begin with verse 15. The crowd accuses these 120 of, they, they must be drunk. I don't know what's going on with them. And Peter gets up and he says, these men are not drunk as you suppose. I mean, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh, this, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. So if you have any problem with uh, Joel, this thing can't mean that. The Bible says this that you just saw take place in that upper room and that spilled out to the streets, this what you are witnessing now, the rising up of the people of God and the building up of the church of Jesus Christ is the result of what Joel spoke about years and years ago when he said, and then I'm going to read words that I just read to you before, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Young men will see visions. Old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. The people are amazed. They get down after Peter preaches to them. Thousands of people. This Peter that was so afraid of himself, so afraid of a damsel woman, couldn't even admit that he was with or knew Jesus Christ. This Peter now filled with that power that enabled him to rise up and to begin to build the church of Jesus Christ. That Peter stands up, preaches, and the result of it is in verse 19, uh, or verse 18, 17. The people heard this, and they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the other apostles, what do we need to do? What do we need to do? Well, Peter then goes back, and he says to them, and let me borrow the language of Joel's prophecy, what you people need to do is rend your hearts and not your garments. What you need to do is cry out to the Lord and ask Him for mercy. What you need to do is turn back to the living God and let Him forgive all your wickedness and all your transgressions. The exact words of Peter was, you need to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you. The promise is for your children. The promise is for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord, our God, will call. That gets down to your generation and mine. That gets down to my day, your day, our day, as many as the Lord, our God. Has God called you? Yes, he has. I trust he has wallowing around someplace wherever it was, devastated, sin had gotten a hold of you, but you, you heard the call of God. The Lord spoke to you, called your name. You heard him. You followed. You rose up. 
And God forgave you all of your sins, all of your trespasses. Your name is written in the book of life. You've been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. By grace, you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves, not because you grew up in church, not because you've come to the LDC conferences 10 years in a row. But it's by grace that you've been saved. Not anything you've done. Only his mercy. And then the Lord, then the Lord has called you to build in the strength that he supplies by the power of his Holy Spirit. And so you take the call seriously in this generation. I'm, I'm the one who the Lord has called. I'm the one who has called today to be part of what God wants to do and is doing. God is doing unprecedented things in the world today. I just read yesterday or the day before, yesterday on the plane coming, about the, fast, the second fastest growing church in the world today is the church in Afghanistan. Now you would think, how could anything happen in Afghanistan? How could God do anything in Afghanistan? I mean, the Americans drew, withdrew, and, and the Taliban came in, and ISIS is back, and the fall, and the collapse. And, and it is pathetic in Afghanistan. I mean, I'm sorry if you're from Afghanistan, but I wouldn't want to go there. And I read the story of a woman who would not leave Afghanistan. She had the opportunity to get out, to go to America. It would have been a lot nicer here for her, more, or more comfortable for here in America. She said, how could I leave Afghanistan? How could I leave Afghanistan and leave them without a witness, without a testimony? Oh, yeah, if I get caught with a Bible on my phone, they'll kill me on the spot. If I get caught witnessing to somebody else and trying to proselytize, they'll, they'll bring me out into the market square and they'll beat me to death in front of the public so they make sure nobody else does this dastardly thing. But how could I leave a light from shining? Because in the midst of the darkness where sin abounds, grace doth much more abound. If God can do that in Afghanistan, he can do it in California. He can do it in the United States. He can do it in my church, our church, his church. And he's just waiting. He's waiting for you. He's waiting for me. He's waiting for us. He's waiting for a community of believers who will say, okay, Peter, James, and John are dead. And so is Thaddeus and Bartholomew and they're all the rest of them. But I'm not dead. I've been made alive unto God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He lives in me, and death doesn't reign in me, but life reigns in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. And I live in the Spirit, and I walk in the Spirit. And by the grace of God, let us build up the kingdom of God in our present age. God is able. And God's able to use you, and He's able to use me. And I got... 25 seconds to quit. So let's bow our heads, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to help us. Jesus, Lord, I, I look at the faces of those that sit in front of me, and I think most of them, if not all of them, are awake. And they smile and they nod. But I can't read their hearts. But you do, Lord, and you see our hearts Search them, O oh God, and know my heart and try me and see if there be any wicked way. And open my eyes that I could see you this morning, Lord. I want to see your holiness. I want to see your glory. I want to see you as you are. Reveal yourself. Reveal yourself to me. O oh Lord Jesus, I turn my eyes on you. I look full in your wonderful face. Lord, may the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of your glory. Lord, you've done much for us. Where have we are glad? You've saved us. You've written our name in the book of life. We're not on the road that leads to destruction. You've taken us and rescued us off of that path and brought us onto a highway that leads to heaven. And Lord, we rejoice in that. We really do. We're so thankful for your grace, your mercy. Lord, maybe there's somebody sitting here and 
we, we've deviated a little. One foot got off the path, and, and before too long, maybe two feet will be off, and we're headed in the wrong direction, and we realize it, but we're okay with it because you're okay with it because we love you and we know you. But Lord, maybe it's not okay. And today, if we hear your voice, Lord, we don't want to harden our hearts, but we want to say yes to you. Jesus, I respond. I come. I just come back to you the way that I am. Restore to me that which the canker worm has eaten away, the, or the things the locusts have destroyed or, or are destroying. Lord, you are able to take care of the locusts. You're the only one that's able. I can't. I can't fight them. I can't stop them. But, Lord, you can. So I ask you to come in. Come to me, Lord, and save me from the destruction. Save me from the devastation, from the pitfall. And then afterward, Lord, fill us with your spirit. Every one of us. We want to rise up. We want to build. But sometimes we find our efforts are weak. Our words are not enough. Our deeds are actions. We'd like to, but we can't accomplish anything with no power but as thou givest. But Lord, give us the help that we need. Give us the strength that we need. Fill us with your spirit, Lord. And until the time when you come and take us home to be with yourself, we pray that we might be a people. We might be a people marked by rising up and building. Help us, we pray. Let us have grace and mercy. Write these words on our heart. Let Joel continue to speak to us and challenge us. And may we find ourselves in the end part of this chapter, day after day, being renewed day by day. Bless the rest of the day, Lord. The meetings that lie before us, they are many. And Lord, our tendency could be to weariness and again, another. But Lord, renew us, revive us, and help us to drink in and receive all that you have in this short time that we're together. Oh Lord, we need help. We need help desperately. So we turn to you. We thank you for it. And in Jesus' name we pray. Close with the chorus from I Give You My Heart. And make that your prayer to the Lord this morning. He's here waiting for you. be seated. Uh, we have about 
a nine minute break before our next session. Oh, Will's gonna make some announcements for us. Uh, again, thank you, uh, Pastor Ernie, Brother Ernie. Uh, I don't know how to address him. I've known him for a long, long time. Uh, more than 30 years, I think. And uh, he's gone from Brother Ernie to Grandpa Ernie to um, just a dear, dear friend. Uh, I really want to thank the Lord for bringing our wonderful speakers here and everybody here, uh, the opportunity for us to come into this time of fellowship. Uh, I, I do want to uh, just kind of encourage everybody. I was sitting there listening. You know, I, for these 30 years listening to uh, Brother Ernie, his, his, his message, his vigor has not diminished. And then uh, I was always sitting there uh, thinking way back. I remember first knowing him and, and he comes to the conference. I was still young and talked about his family. He pulled out his wallet and showed me the picture of Timmy. That was Timmy. Well, that's Tim right there. Uh, he is all grown up now. Uh, he's one of our speakers here. Um, there is this passing on of a baton. There is a movement of the God, of the Lord God, and advancing his kingdom, a message being spoken. Um, I want to ask everybody, please, 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 listen to what God is saying. Uh, the book of Revelation says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. You'll find this common call in all of our speakers there's a hint of warning. There's a hint of rising up of vigilance. Don't stay dormant. Don't stay silent. Don't stay lying down anymore. I, don't, I really believe, you know, every year as we come to these conferences, I love Pastor Yu because every year he's diligent in seeking and asking God, God, where do you want to take SVCA? And I think the message to rise up, let's build together. It is not something that he just dreamt up, not something he just drummed up, not because of, building out Bethel Hall. It is because God has something for us to do. So I want to ask everybody, we got to hear, we got to listen, and then we got to respond. So again, sorry I've been cutting to your rest time, but I want to thank all the speakers for coming. I want to thank everybody who is here. Enjoy this time of fellowship, wonderful time that we have together. And again, I want to ask those of you who are here for the very first time, if you don't meet here on a regular basis, can I ask you to please stand up? We'd like to welcome you. Anybody who falls in that category, or maybe you're just too shy, we don't want to embarrass you. It's not, that's not the point. It's just we want to make sure that this is a special time that you recognize you're not just walking around among us. Nobody? Okay. I guess we all know each other. So praise God. Uh, Aaron, you have something else to add? Okay. And then I, the uh, adults going to gather here. Okay. And the youth will be in uh, the front lobby over there. Okay. Praise God. Have a great time with fellowship with one another.